Good morning, all. Today is the 556th day of war, and here is the latest news in England, Germany, and the United States reported direct from the capitals of these nations. Go ahead, London. This is London, Ed Doyce speaking. There were no air raids on any part of the British Isles last night, presumably due to the weather. Several German aircraft attempted to approach the coast, where, says the air ministry, there was very slight activity. Three German bombers were shot down by RAF fighters off the east coast this morning. The monthly air raid casualty list was issued today. 789 civilians were killed and 1,068 seriously injured in February. The total, though far lower than the monthly average since September, is high in proportion to the number of heavy raids during the month. Colonel Donovan paid his long-expected visit to Southern Ireland today. He flew from London to Dublin and is lunching with Mr. de Valera. He was met at the airport by era government officials and is expected to return to London tonight. The eyes of the 300 Norwegian patriots who left their homes in the Lofoten Islands to be free popped out this morning at their first sight of a city as big as London. But they didn't read themselves praised in the newspapers anymore. In fact, there is no mention of the Navy's raid in the noon editions. The editors were given a tip that there had been too much boasting about a routine naval operation. The News Chronicle this morning, however, drew a moral from the raid. It shows the need for audacity. Audacity, the paper writes, took the British fighting men into the fjords of Lofoten. If the War Department were prepared to exercise the same quality in that other and more important theater of war, there is no one in this country who will not back them to the limit. The lack of audacity, the paper continues, lost us Norway early in the war. Hesitation, unwillingness to decide, were mainly responsible for the long list of reverses that we suffered. In Greece, we have our last bridgehead on the European continent. In Greece, we have our chance to force a second front on the enemy, anxious to avoid that peril to his security. There are heavy risks, the Chronicle admits, but they ought to be run. All the papers and the radio play up reports from Washington that the lease and lend bill is expected to pass the Senate today. There is no comment. The greatest reserve is necessarily maintained. But the idea that shipping is the crux of the whole question is still the main topic of special articles in many of the papers. And some pretty stiff criticism is being leveled against the government. Sir W. Reardon Smith, in his presidential address to the British ship owners meeting yesterday, for example, blamed the lack of cooperation between civil servants and practical shipping men for the de delays in loading and unloading ships at British ports. Shipping men of great ability and experience, he said, have been sidetracked by civil servants in the Ministry of Shipping. There are a number of little stories today which prove that human beings the world over are very much alike. The tie that binds is the cause for which people work or fight. And every country has what are called cranks. In a villa among the lakes of Northumberland, for example, a group of 30 men, some of military age and women, are at this moment calculating by astronomy the length of Christ's life. They are working out chronologically the creation of the world and all that has happened since. They devote all their energies to this cause. Two of the men appeared before a conscientious objectors tribunal at Lancaster. They said they considered the work they were doing as the, quote, highest contribution they could give to the people of Britain, unquote. Their appeal was allowed, and they were exempted from military service. Peculiar people is the headline over the story in the Daily Mail. A reader of the same paper writes to urge that all boys up to 21 ought to be compelled to wear knickers in order to save cotton and wool. Those unable to afford new outfits could cut off their long trousers. The editor asks, why confine the rule to boys under 21? Opponents and proponents of the Oxford group movement in the House of Commons have drawn about level on the eve of a vote. Forty-eight members have now appended their names to Mr. A.P. Herbert's motion to revoke the charter 
of Mr. Buckman's movement because it is harmful to the British cause in many countries. Six of Mr. Herbert's original supporters, including several Catholic MPs, have deserted to the opposition's counter motion drafted by Sir Robert Gower. Sir Robert has mustered 49 supporters for his contention that the Oxford Group campaign strengthened the bonds of friendship between the Empire and the United States. I return you now to the National Broadcasting Company in New York. That was our staff reporter in London giving you the news John Bull will find in his afternoon newspaper. And next we take you over the Atlantic Ocean beyond the British Isles of the English Channel and the occupied lowlands to bring you the news in Germany. Go ahead, Berlin. Hello, NBC. This is Theodore Knott speaking from Berlin. Sensational news coming from Washington is spread all over the front pages of German newspapers this morning. President Roosevelt, it is asserted, is so anxious to keep Yugoslavia out of the three-power pact that he has offered the country a guarantee of her integrity if it refuses to join. The mask has fallen from the aid to England bill, says the Fergusher Beobachter. Roosevelt seeks to prevent the new order in Europe, headlines the Burzen title. Roosevelt wanted to force a promise of assistance on Yugoslavia, the Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung announces. The Monroe Doctrine is for Roosevelt a scrap of paper, is how the date set on Middock puts it. Roosevelt's failure in the Balkans revealed in the Lokal Anzeige and the background of Roosevelt's excited message to Yugoslavia in the 12-hour uh, uh, blot complete the picture given in the press here of the President's alleged move and its subsequent failure. The authority for all these sensational disclosures is a dispatch attributed to the Washington correspondent of a Budapest evening paper, Maja Sag, which I find on inquiry in Hungarian circles, is the official organ of the National Socialist Party in Hungary. The gist of the story is that on February 14th, the day of the, Yugosla the Yugoslav statesman visited the Führer at the Berghof, Mr. Sumner Wells called up the Yugoslav minister in Washington and asked him to come to his house in the middle of the night, where he told him that the president wished to put an end to all further successes of the Axis powers, diplomatic or otherwise, and that the aid to England bill would give America the means to hinder any attempts to introduce the new order in Europe. The further implications of the story in the Hungarian National Socialist paper are to show up the aid to England bill is not so much a defensive measure but one that is aggressive in its nature and, as the Fergus Beobachter says, in lining it up with its own recent disclosures of Roosevelt's policy and the documentary evidence found in Poland and in France in government archives, it is to show that the president's entire policy has been aimed at intervention in the war. The Wilhelmstrasse is inclined to be reticent in its comment on the publicity given the incident in the German press, and when asked on the, about the authenticity the author, authenticity, when asked about the authenticity of the report, reference was made to the dispatch in the Hungarian National Socialist paper. It seems that this Saturday is going to pass by after all without seeing a further signature affixed to the Three Power Pact. Although at the beginning of the week this seemed entirely possible. After the first rush which brought Hungary, Romania, and Slovakia into line on successive days, there has been a certain letter, and it seems that protracted negotiations are necessary now before new adherents are gained. It is learned here that the Japanese Foreign Minister Matsuoka is coming to Berlin, a report that has been rumored for some days and that now finds confirmation from sources that are at least semi-official. Definite announcement may be expected soon. The Russian agency TASS has again come out with a denial, this time of the rumor that Russia had asked Romania to cede her naval bases on the Black Sea. Nothing is known on the Wilhelmstrasse regarding a reply from Turkey to the recent personal message sent to the Turkish president by Adolf Hitler. But it is intimated that it is customary that such a document should receive an answer in due course. Sinkings of British ships are increasing again, the German communique reporting that a submarine had sunk five vessels for a total of 33,000 tons, and that German speedboats had sunk six armed merchantmen and two destroyers in an attack on the southeast coast of England. German planes once more attacked Malta and set fire to a torpedo dump. A British pursuit bomber was shot down and a Sunderland seaplane was set on fire. In England, German planes bombed airports in south and central England and registered a hit on an armament works near Newark and on another near Bristol. 
there were no British planes over Germany yesterday. One of the planes that distinguished itself at Newark, by the way, was commanded by a lieutenant with the same name as myself, but he is no relation that I know of. The new burgomasters that have been appointed in Amsterdam and Harlem were sworn in by the German Reich Co Commissioner Seiss Inquart himself, who said that their appointment was not a reprisal for the recent unfortunate incidents in Holland, but were to prevent their repetition in the future. This is Theodore Knaut, speaking from Berlin and returning you to NBC. Now let's hear the news at home, reported by Earl Godwin from our newsroom in Washington. Good morning, folks. Listening to my colleague Theodore Knaut, I came to the conclusion there's no wonder he nearly choked to death over that story. That probably is as fantastic a tale as I have ever heard. The, this government is not interested and has not had a long arm reaching over into Yugoslavia trying to, trying to uh, influence diplomacy. They do their influencing if home, if possible, and I think that story that he told, which is probably correct, the reported by him as coming from propaganda sources will be denied or laughed at in this town all day today. The leased land bill is over the hump and will be passed. Senator Bennett Clark of Missouri is sure the bill will not pass today, but he seems to be alone in his view. He bases his view that there will be delay on the fact that there are three remaining major amendments which can easily take a lot of time. One amendment, important amendment, which the administration opposed yesterday owes its defeat late yesterday in large measure to the voice of a woman, Senator Hattie Carraway of Arkansas. The veteran Senator Norris of Nebraska, who supports the bill generally, by the way, was urging his own amendment, which prohibits or would prohibit the use of armed forces overseas. Norris said he wanted to assure American mothers that their boys will not go to war. Of course, he conceded that his amendment would not be legally binding, but that it was reassuring. It sounded good. The administration leaders, worried, one by one took the floor against it because there's a tremendous emotional appeal in any argument against war, no matter how legal or illegal it is. Administration leaders urged that the Norris Amendment was meaningless that it would mislead people who would think that this was a declaration that there could not ever be a war. They said it would really deceive mothers and so forth. Then uprose Mrs. Carraway, who rarely speaks, and in a calm voice, the woman senator from Nebraska made the moment dramatic as she said these words. I speak for the mothers who are not afraid. I have had letters from them from all parts of the country. I myself have two sons who are in the army. I believe it would be much safer for them not to amend this bill or weaken it. It was Mrs. Carraway who really saved the day for the bill at that juncture, and I've been told that by administration leaders no later than ten minutes ago. Believe it or not, Senator Norris almost had a victory there until Mrs. Carraway spoke. One remaining amendment for today, in which the country at large will probably take deep interest, is that of Senator Walsh of Massachusetts. His proposal is to forbid the president to give away or lend or rent or sell or dispose of in any manner any military or naval aircraft which cannot be replaced with better equipment in three months. I assume that Walsh speaks for the Navy, or he speaks the Navy view, I should say, because he's close to the Navy, chairman of the Naval Affairs Committee of the Senate, and a firm believer in keeping our Navy to ourselves and for ourselves. Then today, Senators Taft and Toby want to substitute their own bills for the least lend bill. They want to lend money instead of the least lend procedure. And the third hurdle is the opposition motion, which will shell, would shell the whole program. The Walsh Amendment relating to aircraft, I think, has the best chance, but probably will not be adopted. And Earl Godwin says goodbye. That's the news from Washington at this time. Tomorrow, Sunday, this regular morning report is heard over most of these stations at 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. This is the National Broadcasting Company. This is London. Soon it will be spring in England. Already there are flowers in the parks, although the parks aren't quite as well kept as they were at this time last year. The winter that is ending has been hard. But Londoners have many reasons for satisfaction. 
there have been no serious epidemics. The casualties from air bombardment have been less than expected. And London meets this spring with as much courage, though less complacency, than at this time last year. The other day, watching a farmer trying to fill in a 20-foot deep bomb crater in the middle of his field, I wondered what would happen before he harvested the next crop from that bomb-torn soil. I suppose that many more bombs will fall. There will be much talk about equality of sacrifice, which doesn't exist. Many proud ships will certainly perish in the western approaches. There will be further restrictions on clothes and food. Probably a few profiteers will make their profits. No one knows whether invasion will come, but there are those who fear it will not. I believe that a public opinion poll on the question, would you like the Germans to attempt an invasion, would be answered overwhelmingly in the affirmative. Most people, believing that it must be attempted eventually, would be willing to have it come soon. They think that in no other way can the Germans win this war, and they will not change their minds until they hear their children say, we are hungry. So long as Winston Churchill is prime minister, the House of Commons will be given an opportunity to defend its traditions and to determine the character of the government that is to rule this country. The prime minister will continue to be criticized in private for being too much interested in strategy and too little concerned with the great social and economic problems that clamor for solution. British propaganda aimed at occupied countries will continue to fight without its heavy artillery until some sort of statement on war aims, or if you prefer, peace aims, has been published. And in the future, as in the past, one of the strangest sensations for me will be that produced by radio. Sometime, someone will write the story of the technical and military uses to which this new weapon has been put. But no one, I think, will ever describe adequately just what it feels like to sit in London with German bombs ripping through the air, shaking the buildings, and causing the lights to flicker, while you listen to the German radio broadcasting Wagner or Bavarian folk music. A twist of the dial gives you Tokyo talking about dangerous thoughts. An American senator discussing hemisphere defense. The clipped, precise accent of a British announcer describing the proper method of photographing elephants. Moscow boasting of the prospects of the wheat harvest in the Ukraine. Each nation speaking almost any language save its own. Until finally, you switch off the receiving set in order that the sounds from the four corners of the earth will not interfere with the sound of the German bombs that come close enough to cause you to dive under the desk. The bombs this spring will be bigger, and there will be more of them, probably dropped from a greater height than ever before. Berlin and London will continue to claim that their bombs hit military targets, while the enemies strike mainly churches, schools, hospitals, and private dwellings. The opening engagement of the spring campaign is now being fought in the Atlantic. The Admiralty has taken over control of the shipyards in an effort to speed up production and repairs. Merchant sinkings will probably reach alarming proportions, but there will always be men to take the ships out. The outcome of the battle in the Atlantic will be decisive. This island lives by its ships, and the ships will be carrying supplies from America. There was no dancing in the streets here when the Lease and Land Bill was passed, for the British know from their own experience that the gap between legislation and realization can be very wide. They remember being told that their frontier was on the Rhine, and they know now that their government did very little to keep it there. The course of Anglo-American relations will be smooth on the surface, but many people over here will express regret that they believe America is making the same mistakes that Britain made. For you must understand that the idea of America being of more help as a non-belligerent than as a fighting ally has been discarded even by those who advanced it originally. Maybe we shall hear some frank, forthright talk across the Atlantic instead of rhetoric, but I doubt it. One thing that is not to be doubted is that the decisions taken in Washington between now and the time the crops are harvested will determine the pattern of events for a long time to come. British statesmen are fond of repeating that Britain stands alone as the defender of democracy and decency, but General Headquarters is now on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., Many Britishers realize that. Not all of them are happy about it. For the policies of Washington have not always been the policies of the Tory party, which still rules this country. 
Presumably, the decisions of Washington will be taken in the full light of publicity and debate. No mere radio reporter has the right to use the weight of monopolized opportunity in an effort to influence those decisions. We can only deliver to you an occasional wheelbarrow load of stuff, tell you where it comes from, what sort of air raid shelter or bastion you build with it, is a matter for free men to decide. But since part of reporting must necessarily be personal, I'd like to end this with my own impression of Britain on the verge of spring and big events. There's still a sense of humor in the country. The old feeling of superiority over all other peoples remains. So does class distinction. There is great courage and a blind belief that Britain will survive. The British aren't all heroes. They know the feeling of fear. I've shared it with them. They try to avoid thinking deeply about political and social problems. They'll stand any amount of government inefficiency in muddle. They're slow to anger, and they die with great dignity. They will cheer Winston Churchill when he walks through block after block of smashed houses and offices as though he brought them a great victory. During a blinding raid, when the streets are full of smoke and the sound of the roaring guns, they'll say to you, do you think we're really brave or just lacking in imagination? Well, they've come through the winter. They've been warned that the testing days are ahead. Of the past months, they may well say, we have lived a life, not an apology. And of the future, I think most of them would say, we shall live hard, but we shall live. Good morning, everybody. This is the 567th day of the war in Europe. Ready to turn the air over to our newscasters in London, Berlin, and Washington. They'll give you the latest news here and abroad. But first, let's hear from England. Go ahead, London. This is John McVeigh in London. For the second night in a row, German bombers uh, last night concentrated their attacks on Plymouth. The attack is described as only a fairly heavy one, but casualties are believed to have been numerous, and much damage was done to public buildings, shops, and houses. Plymouth is a small city and an old one. Some of its houses have been standing since before the day the pilgrims left the little port for America. When I was there late last summer, the town had had only one raid of any importance, and even then the casualties seemed high for the size of the raid. I remember thinking that some of the rickety old buildings offered little protection from bombs. The raids on the last two nights, with thousands of incendiaries and many high explosives, seemed to have caused a lot of damage. Last night, the bombers, reversing their usual procedure, dropped their high explosives first and followed up with the fire bombs. Some of the new Royal Air Force heavy bombers took part in the British raid on Lorient, the German submarine base on the French coast, last night. It was the third successive night raid on the base and the 48th the British have made on it. Heavy bombs were dropped and the attacks were considered among the most intensive the British have ever made on the port. The Ostend docks were also attacked. Public opinion in Britain is becoming dissatisfied with the RAF policy of short, scattered raids on Germany as compared with the long, concentrated raids the Germans are making on British towns. The British civilians are taking a hammering. They'll continue to take it, but they want to know that the British bombers are handing as good as they get to the cities of Germany. One air expert today asked whether, in view of the experience gained over the past few months, the bombing of cities and large residential districts in general may not, in fact, be more damaging to the enemy's war machine than the bombing of specified military targets. The British are beginning to feel that the RAF bombing policy would be improved by greater concentration and a little less regard for the feelings of the German civilians. Those Britishers who survive a night of heavy bombing, look at their wrecked houses, think of friends and relatives who have been killed and wounded, are inclined to think that a raid on the Bremerhaven docks or the Ham Railroad yards just isn't hitting back hard enough. There's a feeling among civilians here that if the British were to pace the center of Berlin, or knock down the beer houses of Munich. The effect on the German morale might go a long way. Authoritative quarters in London believe that much pressure is being brought to bear by the Germans on the Yugoslavs to secure an agreement that will bring Yugoslavia into general alignment with the Axis. Recent protests by members of the Yugoslav government have produced a crisis and considerable confusion in Belgrade. 
It's thought in London that the Yugoslav public will strongly protest against any lineup for the Axis. Such a step, it is felt, would result in an explosion of public indignation. The Yugoslav desire for independence is thought to have been strengthened by the action of the Greeks. And the Serbs appreciate how important it is for the political and economic life of Yugoslavia for Salonika to remain in friendly Greek hands. The reported meeting between Prince Paul, the Yugoslav regent, and the British minister in Belgrade is unconfirmed in London, but it is known that they have been in contact for the past, in the past few days. Information reaching London today indicates that German submarine experts are now in the Japanese-mandated Spratly Islands in the Pacific, constructing a submarine base. German technical experts are said to be supervising the transfer of Japanese troops from central China to the Canton area. London papers today print without comment reports from Washington that the United States Navy may soon be convoying American war supplies to Britain across the Atlantic. The report that 50 merchant ships may be transferred to Britain within a few days is also given a prominent place on the front pages. Yesterday, British has learned what had been generally known by correspondence here for some time, that the German battle cruisers Scharnhorst and Gneisenau are raiding in the Atlantic. The British have been hunting for the two cruisers with planes and naval units. The South American story to the effect that the vessels are going to convoy Axis, Axis merchant ships from South America to Europe would be a stroke of luck for the British Navy if, if it were only true. The Navy would like nothing better than to catch the Gneisenau, the Scharnhorst, and the fleet of merchant vessels all together. For a few Axis cargo vessels, it would be a welcome addition to the British merchant fleet. The London News Chronicle's competent Lisbon correspondent today gives a description of conditions in both occupied and unoccupied France based on information from what's he, what he calls an absolutely reliable informant just returned from Vichy. The informant reported that Admiral Dolan is now just as dangerous to England as Laval was. He says since becoming vice premier and Pepin's nominated successor, he has allowed personal ambition to overrule all else. This is John McVeigh in London, returning you to the National Broadcasting Company in New York. That was our radio newscaster in London with his report on latest developments. In another few seconds, we shall take you on the other side of the channel to hear about what's going on in the Reich. Go ahead, Berlin. Hello, NBC. This is Theodore Knaut speaking from Berlin. Spring began yesterday with the announcement of a notable successes in the German war on British shipping. The German High Command gave out a report last evening of the sinking of 69,000 tons out of a convoy that was attacked off the west coast of Africa by German submarines. And today the amount is increased to 77,000 tons in a series of attacks that lasted for several days and were renewed over and over again. In all, 11 ships were sunk in the attacks. At the same time comes the news that a German battleship formation in an extensive operation in North Atlantic waters has sunk 22, merchant, uh, 22 merchant ships for a total of 116,000 tons and has rescued 800 survivors. The Air Force has not been behind its sister service and reports the destruction of a further 31,000 tons, including a raid on a convoy off Crete in the Mediterranean, in the course of which a 12,000-ton vessel was set on fire and sunk. That makes altogether 224,000 tons of enemy shipping sent to the bottom by the various kinds of German commerce destroyers. And it is notable to see the use of battleships in this service, evidently on a big scale. Other military news concerns the renewed bombing of Plymouth, again on a considerable scale. The British made no attempts to enter German territory last night, but they did lose in all six planes, the German high command states, while the Germans lost two. News along a diplomatic front is centered today on the changes in the cabinet in Yugoslavia, where three ministers, said to be none too German friendly, and one of them a Freemason, have sent in their resignations. This is evidence of the great strain and stress that has been prevalent under the surface in Yugoslavia right along, caused by the differences of opinion regarding the question of whether the country should openly join the Axis powers, as so many of its neighbors in southeastern Europe have done. The Yugoslavian question is still wide open, and it may be that when Japan's Matsuoka arrives here on Wednesday, he will find a new adherent to the three-power pact ready to sign up. Hungary's foreign minister, Bardoshi, 
has concluded his visit to Hafen Ribbentrop and the Führer at Munich and is on his way back after a series of consultations and an exchange of public toasts in which Hafen Ribbentrop stressed the old companionship in arms of Germany and Hungary in the last war and welcomed the country as an ally in the present one. Conscientious object objectors are dealt with severely in Germany. A group of men and women belonging to the sect of Bible searchers affiliated with the Watchtower Society for Bible Research in America have been tried on charges of interfering with the war, sabotaging air raid protection, and belonging to an anti-military organization. And one of them, 34-year-old Ludwig Siranek, has been sentenced to death. Five others, including two women, have received long prison sentences. The Bible Research sect at one time numbered several million adherents in Germany, but has been prohibited because of its subversive activities and its property confiscated. The famous dining car in which the armistice was signed on November 11, 1918, and in which the French capitulated last June, is to be put on public exhibition tomorrow in the Berlin Lustgarten in connection with the Army Day Drive for winter relief. The car was for years on the regular run between Munich and Constantinople, on the Orient Express, and when the last war broke out, it happened to be in Paris. It was part of the special train of Marshal Foch during the armistice negotiations, then was put into the Invalide in Paris, and later removed to Compiègne, where the Germans found it and put it to use once more. Now it is in Berlin, and here, say the Germans, it is going to stay. Mail deliveries in wartime naturally have had to suffer, what with carriers being withdrawn for army service and their places taken by women. And so many people, to ensure prompt delivery of important letters, have taken to sending them by special delivery. This has been done so much, however, that special delivery service in Berlin has been discontinued. It is announced today, and May will have to take its chances whether important or not. The women letter carriers, streetcar conductors, and such like, many of them trousered, are quite a feature of the street scene here in Berlin, and they do their job efficiently and well, though often under considerable hardships. This is Theodore Knaut, speaking from Berlin and returning you to NBC. Well, that rounds out reports of latest developments in Europe. And now back home, Earl Godwin gives you his report of events along the Potomac from our newsroom in Washington. Good morning, folks. Along the Potomac, we begin to see what all the ballyhoo and plans and production conferences were for. The American miracle of mass production of huge fleets of airplanes, flying ferry boats, and flying fortresses is now all but a fact. The House of Representatives put the final touch on the first phase of airplane production at the rate of nearly 5,000 great planes in a year when it passed that Army Appropriation Bill of $4 billion yesterday in four hours, a billion an hour, and a record of 15 billions for defense in two weeks. This bill of yesterday was the final, tangible, hard-boiled actuality of the Army needs for this next fiscal year which starts July 1st, 1941. Just why the government bookkeepers insist on starting their year July 1st is one of the amazing red tape mysteries of Washington. Uncle Joe Cannon used to say it was plum laziness. Anyhow, that's the fact. The army now starts with money to build up the groundwork for a four million man army. It gets the cash for the munitions and support of a two million man army in this July 1st year I'm talking about. It gets all but a, it, all but a billion dollars, nearly a billion dollars for new plants and shops and warehouses and tools, which will be the start of mass production, which gets underway in fact and not merely in advance promises. And we learn that we are to have from 12 to 40 flying fortresses per day when all this work gets going in this next 12 months. We learn too that the British have said our current flying fortresses Bombers with a range of 5,000 miles on one charge of gas and new hard-hitting guns are the best in the world, and they've tried some of them out. They've tried them out in actual combat. We hope to send Great Britain 11,000 of these planes in the next two years, and that would be in addition to about the same number of planes from here Britain has already ordered. That would be a little more than 22,000 of these fine new planes. 
The Lend-Lease Bill, by the way, is up in the Senate today, which meets on Saturday, unusually, as the effort is made to ram the program through. It would not be surprising if the Senate should pass this $7 billion bill in one session. And incidentally, the Senate's committee takes up that same army bill that I'm talking to you about with all its planes and plants, the one that the House finished yesterday. Speed and action are things going on in this busy nation, national capital just at this time. But... 39,000 men are idle in 25 big plants, according to the report this morning. 25 big plants that are turning out essential defense materials, or should be. As the President's Mediation Board starts, Representative Smith of Virginia charges in Congress that this board is powerless to affect anything. And the government, by the way, may take steps today, to, or this next week, to force the reopening of that great big Alice Chalmers plant near Milwaukee with its 9,000 men and it's $45 million in orders for heavy machinery. That big plant has been closed now since January 22nd by a strike. There are even hints that the Army and Navy may consider taking over the plant, and according to lawyers here, there are at least two ways under existing laws by which the government might step in and operate the plant. Earl Godwin says goodbye. That's the news from Washington at this time. For the latest news, listen to NBC. We invite you to keep your radio tuned to this station. This is the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York. The diplomatic correspondent of the Italian newspaper Tribuna writes that England and France are spreading false and misleading rumors about alleged intentions of Germany in the Balkans to create trouble and panic in that area which has so far been kept out of the war. The Italian journalist points out that these allegations against Germany are entirely unfounded because every German interest favors the maintenance of peace in the Balkans, whereas only England and France could be interested in causing trouble in this region which is so important for German supplies. <laughs> 